Hello and welcome to Guest Chef Night at Home, Art of Appetizers. I am Chef Wayne Johnson. I am here in the kitchen in South Lake Union in Seattle, generously provided to us by Amazon. Before we get started to help center equity in our work and conversation, I want to begin by acknowledging we are on ancestral lands of Coast Salish people and specifically stand on the lands of the First Peoples of Seattle, the Duwamish. We honor with gratitude the land itself, the Duwamish people who have stewarded it past and present. For nearly 30 years, Fair Start has been transforming lives, disrupting poverty and nourishing communities through food, life skills, and job training. When COVID hit, we paused our programming, transformed our kitchens, redeployed our staff to ensure individuals and families in the Seattle area did not go hungry. I'm excited to say our teams have produced over two and a half million emergency meals. I might say that again. Our teams have produced over two and a half million emergency meals. And I think, yeah, let's give them a little hand for that. While doing this, our programs team was supporting our students and graduates through virtual job training, case management, and wraparound support. I mean, our work probably looks a little different right now than before, but we know at Fair Start, our programs is what's sustaining and transforming lives. Our students and grads couldn't join us here tonight in the kitchen, but many of them are joining us virtually. This event it's completely free. Although, if you want to help support us at Fair Start, we welcome your donation at fairstart.org. We are thrilled to have our virtual guest chef night at home, supporting local restaurants and chefs, supporting community, and allowing us to have some fun. That same fun we had at guest chef nights before COVID. Speaking of COVID, all our safety protocols will be in place tonight. Most of the night you'll see me masked up. I'm socially distanced from our guest chefs. Our guest chefs are socially distanced from our camera crew who are also in masks. We take safety and health seriously and I hope you do too. Tonight is my privilege to welcome two powerhouse chefs in our Seattle region, Chef Rachel Yang, of Jewel and Revel, and Chef Melissa Miranda from Moussain. They're going to teach us the art of appetizers tonight. We did provide a shopping list ahead for folks who wanted to practice with the chefs. So now would be a good time to get all your stuff together and get ready to go. I have one more housekeeping item. So if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. And we'll try to get and answer as many of those questions back in the chat as possible. Now let's get this night started. I'd like to welcome Chef Rachel. Rachel, please tell us a little bit about yourself and what your appetizers are tonight. <laughs> Hi, Chef Wayne. Hi, everyone. My name is Rachel Yang. I'm a chef owner of Jewel and Rebel here in Seattle. And we are here to make two appetizers. I know that when we first talked about it, it was a little, little ambitious to two, but they're really easy. And I think you can actually follow it at home, like really easy and fast. So let's just get started. So chef, uh, we're gonna do a really quick uh, appetizer salad, maybe the soft tofu and kimchi. And I'm, I'm so excited about, I mean, kimchi and tofu, oh my goodness. It's a perfect combination and you know how we make kimchi at our restaurants and it's one of my favorite things to have at all meals. So we, I actually have two dishes that we're doing tonight and both have kimchi. So, All right. <laughs> first, I'm going to actually cut some tofu. This is a uh, silken tofu. Um, if you don't have silken tofu, you can also use just regular soft tofu as well. I'm just going to take a little small piece out. Okay. And you can kind of cut it into bite size. They are obviously very easy to cut. 
And the great thing about tofu is that they're just a kind of blank canvas. And it's really fun to have them with uh, dressing that has a lot of flavor. And then a lot of flavors that will have that fully here. I, I really love the way you like, I thought you were gonna put a whole chunk in there, but I love the way you like slice through there and made nice little cubes. Yeah. Like bite size. You, you can do a nice presentation with this too. Um, this we'll do with the, we're gonna chop up some kimchi. Uh, and the dressing is very simple. People are always kind of stumped with the how to make salad dressing at home. I mean, you just need obviously some sort of oil and some sort of a vinegar aspect of it. I have a, a canola oil and rice vinegar. But on top of that, everything else is a flavor. Anything that you want to add to that gives you a flavor that you want. We're going to have some tahini, some mirin. So you got some something salty, something sweet. Here's the rice vinegar. Here's I, canola. I, I like the way you added that, that mirin and you say add a little bit of salt because a lot of other like just standard, you know, vinaigrettes or recipes, they might start out with a little bit of salt to get that same saltiness. Right? Exactly. And then this is a little bit of tahini. So this is my kind of like secret ingredient that I like to use, especially um, in Asian cuisine, we use a lot of sesame oil. But mm -hmm. however, sometimes sesame oil can be very overpowering. So what I like to do is I add tahini instead, which is sesame paste. Okay. And it kind of makes it really kind of nice, thick and uh, vinaigrette. Oh yeah, look at that. Because it becomes a nice binder. So, now I'm going to cut some kimchi. It's a little messy sometimes, so bear with me. Now, is your, your kimchi that you make, is it really spicy or is it mild or? So I'll say like, I'll say three and a half star out of five. Um, okay. They're not too spicy. They're not really meant to be super spicy. It really meant to have basically a really good combination of like sourness and little sweetness, little spicy and salty. It really has all the flavor. And more than anything, it is fermented. So it's got that kick, which is really awesome. So if I wanted to make kimchi at home, how long does it have to ferment? Yeah, so normally we do about five to seven day fermentation and you can ferment them in a kind of slightly below the uh, room temperature. So anywhere from like, you know, 60 to 65 actually is really good temperature. And then after that, remember kimchi is still alive. So it means when it goes into the, your fridge, it still continues to ferment. It's alive. <laughs> I love I it. I know, exactly. <laughs> well, that's why I like having a, a multiple recipes you can make with kimchi. Because sometimes people would buy a jar of kimchi at home, but then it's really hard to, you know, eat every day, whatnot. And then uh -huh. so you, if you have multiple recipes that you can use kimchi for like, you know, eating it fresh, eating it in a salad, eating in a pancake they want to make later, then it's really easy to use it up here. I'm going to actually move my cutting board. Okay, while you're doing it, I'm going to, I'm going to roll you back just a little bit. So in our vinaigrette, and you made what, about a half a cup here? Yeah. You put in what, two tablespoons possibly of the mirror? Yeah, it's got a little mirin, little uh, tamari, little tahini, yep. rice vinegar, and then canola oil. And then it's all, okay, beautiful. All right, so we're adding this kimchi here. So a couple of tablespoons of exactly. kimchi. Yeah, so what we get is basically a, you know, that dressing that has so much flavor that really goes all well with um, anything. So let's see. Now we can actually plate it right away. So feel free to be generous with this. Remember the tofu has no flavor, so it really is, wants all the flavor, wants all the yumminess in there. We're gonna garnish it. Okay. Some scallions. Scallions, nice. And uh, bonito flakes. So oh. these are basically a dried and smoked shaved fish. Look at that, beautiful. Yeah. Whoa. And it has really and just nice smoky kind of umami flavor to it, so. See, that, like, it's only been probably what, five minutes and we already have our first dish. Now, everybody should be able to make that. That is beautiful. <laughs> and you did that in a matter of minutes. I know, it's really and, easy. And, ma and made the dressing. It really That's is. what I love about yeah. it. Okay, I, I'm, I'm gonna taste that. Oh, I know. In a minute, okay. I'm gonna taste that. Uh, let me get the second dish going too. Yep. 
I'm gonna get my pan just a little bit warm. So second dish is the pancake. Um, it is, gosh, I mean like Kim, the uh, Korean pancake is something that, you know, we had at our restaurant level from day one. And it is a, people are often really questionable about this because like pancake, like it's a <laughs> breakfast food. Like what are you, why are you having pancake for dinner? But what we have here is like, it's a Korean savory pancake. And it's just really yummy because it's, it's filling, but it's light. You can have it as a lunch. You can have a side dish for your dinner. And the one thing that's kind of like it's surprising is that we are going to be using this peeled mung bean. Um, these are uh, peeled and split you know, yellow mung bean. You can also get it at Indian store. They're called mung dal uh, or Asian store. Um, you're using this instead of uh, AP flour. So people who are actually want gluten-free option, this is a great, great way of doing it. Um, this is super simple. All I have done is a, I actually hydrate this mung beans in water and I let it sit for about, you know, two hours or so. Um, just enough water. Put up, uh, sometimes it may actually like it doubles the size. So you can have basically, if you have a cup of mung bean, you can add a cup of water and it will hydrate back. Uh, and I'm going to basically simply blend it all to just make the batter. So here's my blender. So about an hour, two hours will soften that bean enough to make a paste. Exactly. For your pancake. I'm excited about this. So if you have a nice, strong blender at home. There you go. Oh, yeah. All right. So actually, I'm going to add a little bit more mung bean. It's got a little bit loose. So the consistency you're looking for is kind of like nice thick pancake batter consistency. I think a little too much water got in there when I first was pouring it in. Here we go. One more time. Here we go. Perfect. Okay. So we got our mung bean all done. So I, so I like the way you did the consistency of that. And look at that. Like yeah. you say, just like a nice little batter. Exactly. I mean, like sometimes cooking can be tricky, not knowing exactly what you're looking for. But like, this is what we like to do. You know, you know, there is a, if your, your mung beans are soaked too long, you might need as much water. If it's not soaked enough, then you might need more water when you're blending it. Kind of know what you're looking for. You're looking for a thick, thick, thick batter uh, recipe. Um, so here, we're going to add all the seasoning here. Actually, let me chop up some scallion to go in. We already have some chopped kimchi. So here's my knife again. So Rachel, you said this one is on your menu. It has been on your menu. So right now, actually, we don't have it on the menu, but it actually was on our menu for a really long time. It's a kimchi pancake. Um, we've always done it with the pork belly. Um, we got a really nice bacon here. Um, pork belly, kimchi, tofu, they're just kind of like really like perfect combination. And then using bacon is, you know, you always have it at home. And it's nice and smoky. It works really well with kimchi too. And we're going with raw bacon. We're doing a raw bacon, but okay. let's chop it really small. You know, if you, and okay. you can also uh, just cook it a little bit and render it before you put it in as well. I, I just want to make sure at home they're not like throwing it in the oven right now trying to cook it. <laughs> <laughs> I know you don't have to. <laughs> this recipe is again, everything goes into this batter and it can be quite simple. I'm going to add my scallions and then add my kimchi. I'm not going to put too much liquid here because it's, the batter is kind of perfect and I don't want it to be too wet. There you go. So it looks like you got about a good cup and a half of batter. You got about five good scallions chopped up and now about three tablespoons about the kimchi. Yeah. And now. So this is gochujang. So this is Korean chili paste. Mm -hmm. People are a little scared of it. It might be too spicy and it is really not. It's actually uh, has really nice sweetness to it. And as you can see, this is very thick. And it, so this works really great in your sauces and your like, uh, stews, um, people even put it in like, you know, soups and like the pasta dishes. It's, it can be really versatile. Just think of it as your like favorite hot sauce that you want to use that's not too, 
not too spicy. We're going to season it with some fish sauce. I'll be honest, I've even used goji gan for breakfast with my eggs, my scrambled eggs. Oh my eggs. gosh, totally. Oh my so good. I know. It's like once you start <laughs> trying with the, you know, every culture has their own, own hot sauce, right? And like when you, I mean, and, and everyone loves hot sauce and trying it on your favorite, either pizza or chicken wings. I mean, like that's such a great way of just kind of opening yourself up to different culture and different food. And that's when you get to have fun. Okay, so... Here is our batter. It came out really simple and easy and together. Now you can see you got, we got some sourness from kimchi, some, some heat from our gochujang, a little bit of savory saltiness from fish sauce, and it's ready to go. Okay, so we're gonna come over here. I have a little nonstick pan, and I'm gonna get some, a little bit of canola oil again, heating it up. And what's the oil you're actually using? What do you like for this? So we like to use canola oil. Uh, canola oil is uh, often just very neutral, very easy to use. Yeah, okay. Canola. Okay. I'm just going to spread a little bit. You want it uh, probably about just a little over a quarter inch thickness in this batter. It spreads really nicely. There you go. So here's another thing that makes people really want, what makes people quite question what we are doing here because we're gonna put some cheese on it and everyone's like, I thought you were making Korean food. Why are you putting cheese on it? So <laughs> obviously there's a very traditional way, traditional that recipes that, you know, the kimchi pancakes are all about. But however, if you go to Korea right now and go to all these hot restaurants and, you know, cafes, you will see cheese everywhere. The Korean people love putting cheese. They love mozzarella because it's all about that super just creamy pulling cheese. And it actually makes a lot of sense because something sour, something spicy works mm -hmm. really wet with fatty cheese. So it actually, it, it's, it flavors awesome. And then it does another job of once I put it in there and melt it, and then it's going to get nice and crispy on the pan. So you will see what happens here. All right, so I'm about ready to flip this actually because I can see the side of the, my pancakes getting nice and brown. And you can kind of see on the other side that it's, be ready to be flipped. So I'm going to sprinkle my cheese all over. And yes, you can be generous. You can be generous with that. There you go. Uh, I'm getting excited about this one I here. Know. Okay. 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 People get very scared. I know about <laughs> flipping a pancake. Everyone has a horror. So here is, I mean, here's a quick tip. So most important thing is that you're not flipping it on a flat to flat. You have to be on an angle because they will, it will be easier to catch you. So basically you're sliding down, up and down. So it's it's not a, you're trying to flip it into the air and have it flip over and then drop it on your pen. Okay. Very dangerous, obviously, because you can splat over the oil all over you. Yes. But this will be really fun. So make sure you get a good angle, get it to the corner. Oh. Like, just like that. And you don't have to go too high. <laughs> Stay low. Okay, I'm gonna just kind of pat it a little bit to spread my batter and make it even. Cheese is, you know, nicely melting on the bottom. And you can see the color. It's just really nice and golden brown. This is exactly what you're looking for. Okay, so I'm gonna take my cutting board out. Okay, you made that flip look super easy. Is there is there any other way for I, somebody I, at home to- I have flipped though. Few pancakes in my life, actually. So. <laughs> I know I, sometimes I've done paella, right? Yeah. And, and they, they, they'll actually put it on a plate and then slide it back in. Is that oh possible gosh. with that or no? Because the cheese, right? You can. You mean just go like this and then slide it back down? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can do that too. Okay, okay. I know. You, have, you don't have to be scared. And you can, yes, absolutely. You can just use your spatula, flip it. No one's going to judge. <laughs> it's your kitchen. I just want to make sure I'm not sticking too much. There you go. 
So you pretty much kept your kitchens open throughout the whole pandemic, right? Yeah, so we have our kitchen um, open. Takeout was our huge, you know, help. I mean, like, it's been amazing to have all these neighborhood people who really supported us throughout this pandemic. I mean, we wouldn't be here without them. So thank you for everyone who supported the Seattle restaurant community because it wasn't easy for everyone, anyone. And, like, you know, the fact that we're surviving, we're, I hope the end is almost near. So, yes. And we're all still here. So, this is what's really awesome. Like now I got a really nice golden brown cheese, like nice and crispy cheese, you know, stuck in the bottom. And that is exactly what I'm looking for. That is so, so beautiful. Actually, uh, Chef Wayne, I can actually cut a small piece and then um, so you can sample if we want to. All right, all right. Let's do that. I'm ready for that. Okay, let's bring up this over. All right. So. Ready to go. See, that's the, that's the money shot right there. Cheese pulling. All right. It's a pancake. Yeah, so this is our kimchi bacon cheese, savory pancake, and our soft tofu. Um, salad with kimchi vinaigrette. So kimchi two ways. So even if you have a jar of kimchi at home, don't worry, you can eat them all and they all will be delicious. <laughs> These are two really great recipes and pancake gluten-free. Pancake is gluten-free and this is gluten-free. We use tamari, which is, is gluten-free as well. So yeah, lots of options for anyone who Loves food. So kimchi, I know that, you know, when you go to the store, there are lots of gluten-free options. There are vegan kimchi. I'm sorry. There's a lot of vegan options. Uh, and that's okay. I mean, like, I personally have to have fish sauce and shrimp paste in my kimchi. But, you know, still it, it gives that kind of, you know, funkiness and spiciness, you know. For me, that I do a lot of fusion food. And the thing is, like, I, like people, so if that's a way for people to experience, you know, different, different, uh, food. I mean, that's okay because I mean, like, I, I'm here to basically show them like what it could be, you know, what it what it has to be. So, thank you, okay. Chef Rachel. Absolutely fabulous. I mean, that pancake. I'm I'm ready to get in there. I'm gonna get in there. Um, so while we prepare for the second half of our show. I'll be bringing on Chef Melissa, who will also be doing a great appetizer. Uh, please enjoy this brief video of Fair Start and our partners doing some great work on food insecurity. Hello, my name is Chef Danny, and I oversee the food recovery program here at Fair Start. When you think about Fair Start, you probably think of some place like this. That's for good reason. Fair Start has been around for about 30 years, transforming lives with food. Millions of meals come together in our Fair Start kitchens, made by our amazing Fair Start chefs for our neighbors in need. But they actually start here. Isn't this beautiful? We're at T-Bug, the Bellevue Urban Garden. We work with local farms and producers to get fresh ingredients for our meals. We're hosting a gleaning event here today where our volunteers are gathering fresh produce to support our meals program. At Fair Start, we wanna provide meals that showcase the best local ingredients no matter who we're serving. And we're so lucky to have partnerships like these that support our meals that bring dignity to our community, as well as training and jobs for our students. We get high quality product from distributors and producers that supplement food cost and prevent tons of waste. These donations help us extend our meals to many more people than we would have otherwise. We're so grateful to our partnerships that donate so much fantastic product, including this amazing sable fish from Alaska. So much collaboration goes into these many, many meals we make here at the Fair Start Kitchen. All this fantastic donated ingredients are delivered to our chefs who do an amazing job of putting delicious, nutritious meals together for our community. We're so thankful for these partnerships that support our mission.
Welcome back. We are so happy to have you back. And I'm so proud. I hope you enjoyed that video. I am so proud of the part that Fair Start and our community leaders, what they're doing to help reduce food insecurity. Now, as promised, I'm bringing to you Chef Melissa Miranda from Musang. And the things they're doing in this community, the things that are happening. And, and just before we go there, I just want to ask the question. For those of you that did follow along with Chef Rachel, I don't know about you, but I got a bite of that pancake. And oh, my God, that is so good. So we're going to learn another appetizer this evening. We're going to go to Chef Melissa. Melissa, nice to have you. Thank you. Thank you, Chef Wayne, Welcome. for having me. This is me. so good. <laughs> what I'd really like to know, you're doing so much in the community. Um, you've had a star career. You're, you're, I mean, you're just all over the place. <laughs> I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about how you got in the business, what you and your team are doing, yeah. and then how your restaurant fared and weathered the pandemic. Yeah. And then you can tell us about the appetizer. Okay. That? <laughs> that sounds great. Um, like Chef said, I am Melissa from Musang in Beacon Hill. Uh, it's been a crazy journey, to say the least. Uh, for those of you who don't know, um, Musang started as a pop-up restaurant um, about five years ago. Um, we started doing pop-ups at Bar del Corso in Beacon Hill. Mm -hmm. And it kind of stemmed from me driving through Beacon Hill one day and realizing that all of the Filipino restaurants that once existed were all gone. And I wanted to make sure that we could create a space that we could share and teach people what Filipino food is. Um, we wanted to create a foundation, a safe space, and a creative space for not just myself, but also young Filipino cooks and just our community. Um, so we started our pop-up and we did that and, um, you know, three years in, we decided to open a brick and mortar. We did a huge Kickstarter campaign um, and that really showed the community support of the vision and what we wanted to accomplish. Uh, so after, after that, we found this beautiful old home um, on Beacon Avenue and we started building out and we thought we were going to be open sooner, just like any restaurant, uh, restaurant tour. Right. Um, but we ended up opening in January of 2020. So oh, wow. <laughs> a lot of people are asked, um, you know, how was it? Cause the pandemic obviously started like, or came about in March. Two months, right? Yeah. You know, and like we had just opened and we had opened to such kind of great reception from the community. Like the first two and a half months we were opened, it was a packed house. We had lines out the door. I think I remember lines going around the block if I yeah, remember. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so like in any situation, you'd be like, this is the dream, you know? And needless to say, we um, made the decision to actually close our restaurant sooner than was mandated in March of last year. And um, we converted our restaurant space into a community kitchen. Um, and we were open seven days a week and we were doing almost 200 meals a day. Oh my gosh. And it was just me and my sous chef. Um, a big reason why we decided to also close is that most of my team, um, lives in multi-generational homes. And it's for me as an owner, the safety of my employees is always what comes first. The safety of our community is always what comes first. Uh, and so knowing that schools weren't going to be able to provide meals for families and children, that kind of was the inspiration for us to start our community kitchen, um, really trying to support the South, like South Seattle community. So we did that um, for two and a half months, wow. seven days a week. Um, we were partnered with Gorilla Pizza Kitchen and other friends of ours who helped also donate time. Um, and food for us. Um, but it was, I think for me, as I look back, there was no question for us to like not feed the community. Um, 
it was just the right thing to do. You know, like we had the restaurant. Yes, we just opened. Yes, yeah. it was like <laughs> we're not doing what we thought we were going to be doing. But in another way, um, it really helped us, I guess, show that we really are truly about community. Community, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, we always say that Musang is a community-driven restaurant and not a chef-driven restaurant. It's because I'm dedicated to my team and to empower them so that one day they can also open up their own space. Um, it's a place where people can come in and learn about Filipino culture and the hospitality and the food. And in a way, the community kitchen really brought that out to life. Because yeah. It was more than just eating at a restaurant, having that experience. It was about us showing up, even so, though it was so hard. <laughs> so I love the aspect about you, you, you teaching and bringing up the, the younger generation mm -hmm. because um, a lot of times that's how it gets lost. If, if we don't pass it on, yes, 100%. we lose it. Right? Yeah. And, and one of the other things I really love about, um, what you did was um, there was not a lot of Filipino restaurants to get that kind of cuisine, those flavors. Yeah. So a big chance you took. Yeah. And it, it came out all right. Yeah, definitely a big chance. I think there's a lot of, um, you know, within Philippine culture, I think a lot of the reasons why we weren't as successful was this kind of crab mentality that existed because everyone would say, well, my mom cooks it better or my grandma cooks it better. And I know a lot of people can relate to that. Yes. And for us, it was like, but here we are, we're cooking for every single other chef. We're, you know, we're cooking all the different types of cuisines, but why can't we cook our own cook food? Our own. Absolutely. And, you know, um, my whole team practically in the kitchen are all young Filipino cooks that have cooked all over the city. And to be able to finally give them a home of their own food they grew up with for their own culture. Yeah. I mean, it's probably one of the most rewarding things um, because we get to grow together. Nice. And nice. it's really, I don't know, it's just super beautiful. That's a beautiful story, actually. I mean, and, and, and one that's for the ages. I hope everybody hears that and the aspect of bringing up the youth and, and maintaining culture is so important. And I know we're going to get into this appetizer, I just want to remind people that if you got your grocery list together, this is a good time to go over that. And we're going to get busy here in a minute. You want to tell us what your appetizer is? Tonight? Yes. Um, so tonight I'm going to be making a uh, sardine toast. Um, the inspiration of it is actually a childhood dish that I grew up in, um, eating called sardinas. Um, sardines in the Philippines would come in a can mm. <laughs> and the can would already have the tomato sauce and everything in it. And all you'd have to do is just pop it on a pan, heat it up and eat it with rice. Um, and it's just such an easy dish. We'd eat it for breakfast, for snacks. Um, but I wanted to t kind of like introduce it in a way that's a little bit differently. But when you t like take a bite out of that dish, it's still that ratatouille moment of like, Oh, yeah, I remember the sardines in the can. Well, I think what's really cool about this, though, <laughs> is the fact that, I mean, I really think this is cool. The fact that now they can see and they know where all their ingredients are coming from. Yeah. Where when you get something out of a can, sometimes I'm like, oh, uh -huh. <laughs> what else is in here? <laughs> exactly. And it's super simple. It's really easy to make. Um, I also spend a lot of time in Italy. So there's this idea of just like putting things together that are very fresh, super seasonal, and then making things easy that you can just make at home. Um, and I think that's kind of what the inspiration of this dish was too. So I know we're going to use some canned sardines, yes. which are really nice sardines. Mm -hmm. I see that. Yes. Um, if it was sardine season and we're actually catching them, would there be something we need to do to the sardines or could we just take that fresh sardine and do the same thing you're doing? Um, I think that uh, a fresh sardine definitely would work. Just do it, huh? Okay. I think, um, yeah, I think that'd be really delicious. Maybe squeezing some fresh lemon on top. Oh. Um, that'd be a very fresh kind of way to, to adapt that for our dish. So maybe just to give them a chance to catch up. Yes. What are the items we're using tonight? 
Yes, yeah, so the items we're using today um, are fennel. We have cherry tomatoes, um, onions, garlic. I've got some arugula right here. Uh, and then I've got sourdough bread, which is just right over here. Um, the steps for this, uh, we're going to uh, make a guisado. A guisado in um, Philippine like cooking is always tomatoes, onions, and garlic. And mm. it's kind of like a trifecta that we use in a lot of things. Um, so that's the base for sardinas. Okay. Uh, so we're going to start doing that, uh, and then we'll get all, all of our veg prepped and then assemble everything together. Sweet. Let's do it. Okay. All <laughs> right. So I'm going to start with the guisado sauce. I've got some minced garlic here um, and some diced onions. And you do know, if we weren't in COVID land right now, I'd be over there with you I know. Help away. me too. <laughs> <laughs> Soon, I hope. But yeah, I've got diced onions, minced garlic. I'm going to put those here. And then I'm just going to chop up some cherry tomatoes. Um, I remember this is a dish that I served at one of my pop-up events. And a lot of like the Philippine, older Filipinos were like, this isn't sardinas. But when they took a bite, they were really surprised that it, it tasted that way. So it didn't look the same, but, but that yeah. flavor came through. Exactly. Right? Which so, I think a lot of the dishes at Musang are like that same way of like, it might not look the same, but it gives you that memory of, of yeah. eating that childhood dish. And I'm, I'm looking at these tomatoes and we know that tomatoes grow in all different sizes. Mm -hmm. When you're talking about cherry tomatoes or the petite ch tomatoes. Yeah. So if, if folks out here are having a little bit larger tomato, they may just cook it down a little longer, right? Exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, okay. I like using cherry tomatoes because of the sweetness and the brightness of the tomatoes. But if you have Roma tomatoes, they work just fine. Just cook them down a little longer, like you said. Maybe add a li little bit more seasoning. Um, you could add a little bit of lemon to kind of add a little bit more acidity. Um, but yeah. That's definitely something that you can adapt and change. I think, I think the fun thing about tomatoes, too, I'll just think about this, is as you pull them from the vine and taste it, how you get different flavors. Mm -hmm. So you could actually make this sauce at different times of the year, and that may change, the, change it a little absolutely. bit. Absolutely. <laughs> I think that's why I kind of tend to like making this dish in the summertime. Yeah. Um, because that's when tomatoes are best, and... It's a really nice kind of uh, just like bright, easy dish. Um, in the in the winter time, I think I'd crave something a little bit more hearty. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm gonna get cooking over here. Um, I've got my saute pan. I'm just gonna get it going. I grab some olive oil. Um, and then in Philippine cooking, we always use the garlic first, oh, which is okay. very different than what we're taught in culinary Cause, school. <laughs> right, because they always sweat the onions first. Exactly, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, and so we like to cook the garlic first because it browns, it gets a lot more flavor out. You just have to be careful not to burn it because that's something that can happen. Yeah. Um, and the smell of this is just like, something that reminds me of my childhood just the smell of garlic and onions cooking so you wake up in the morning and grandma's got some garlic going on the stove mm -hmm. <laughs> i'm going to season it with a little bit of salt and i'm going to add my onions in you know, I'm almost glad you brought that up because not everything's got to be by the book. And when you start talking about different cultural cooking, yeah. that doesn't mean they're all French-based. Exactly. Right? I'm going to add more salt, 
Adding the salt helps uh, bring out the moisture in the onions and it helps caramelize it better and adds more flavor. And don't rush. I think sometimes in cooking, we tend to rush things, but it's really about those steps of building the flavors that really can achieve a dish that's just so simple. It's just taking that extra care. I don't know. If Wayne always says layers of flavor. Exactly. Build on it. Build yeah. on it. <laughs> All right. I'm going to add my tomatoes. What did you do? Maybe about a, two teaspoons of garlic? Uh, yeah, about two pieces of garlic. Probably about a quarter of an onion. Quarter of an onion, yeah. okay. And rather than sweating your onions first, you sweated your garlic a little bit. Exactly. Let it start to toast, and then you put your and onions. And then I put my onions in. And then you put the salt, and it helped to put a little moisture in there so that your garlic did not burn. Exactly. That's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. <laughs> Add a little pepper. And I'm just going to let that, I'm going to bring down the heat. And let the, so, onion, or the tomatoes cook and break down. Okay, so I have another question. At what age did you know I'm just going to cook? <laughs> you know, that's such an interesting question. Um, I actually, so I went to the University of Washington, and I have a degree in sociology. But I got introduced into the restaurant industry um, at 18, and I worked as a front of house, like, hostess and server and I got introduced into this incredible world that is just like the people that you meet I think in the restaurant industry are people that you will never meet in your lifetime unless you're in the restaurant industry mm. and you get to connect with folks that come from such different ways of life yeah um and I met um a couple of people that actually spent time in Italy and so uh, after I graduated college, I actually took the leap and I moved to Florence because they inspired me to move to Italy. Uh, and I ended up going to culinary school in Florence. Hey, mom, dad, um, <laughs> I'm going to Italy. <laughs> uh -huh, I'm going to Italy. Um, nice. Yeah. And so then I think growing up, it was my father that always influenced like my cooking. And he was always in the kitchen. Like, my mom cooked too, but it was primarily my dad. And I would be his, like, little sous chef growing up, cleaning squid, cleaning fish. And he always kind of just taught me, like, freshness is important, using, like, the best ingredients are important. Taste your food. And I don't know, I just, like, fell in love yeah. with food and flavors and Never in my life did I think that I would be here right now <laughs> doing this, but I am so grateful um, But to I'm be sure here. that degree helps you a lot with the people you meet in the kitchen. I think we, so, yeah. We, we all need somebody like you. <laughs> we to do. Keep us on the line. Like, right? how do we work together as a team right. and, and understanding <laughs> characters and personalities? Definitely. That's, that's, that sounds fun. Yeah. yeah. All right. So my tomato sauce is here. I'm going to get my fennel shaved. Okay. Um, so you can do this two ways. Um, we have a mandolin with us today, but you can also just do it with your knife. I'm going to take the tops and the bottom, put them aside. Stock. You can use it for stock. Okay. Um, it'd be great for like a fish stock. Um, you can always use the tops as a garnish. You can add them to a salad. Um, I'm just going to cut the fennel in half. And then I'm going to get our mandolin. Uh, be very careful because this can cut your finger. <laughs> we always say, go slow. Yes. Don't go fast. Um, but I'm going to take my fennel and go this way. And we're going to shave it super thin. And then we're going to shock it in ice water, which I have right here. Um, and this is going to be part of the salad that's going with our sardinas toast. And then if you don't have a mandolin, 
just make sure you have a super sharp knife. And I'm going to go around in a radial. Um, and you can just... Uh, shave your fennel this way and it'll come out nice and thin too. So then there's like the, I'm looking at it, there's the, the little sections that mm -hmm. will break down and that's why you cut it on that on, radial. Yes, exactly. Yes. So then we yes. have more of an even cut on the fennel. Yeah. Whereas if you cut it straight down, you're going to have to you get the long. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> um, so I'm going to shock these in here. I'm going to add a little bit of lemon to help so it doesn't discolor the fennel. I'm going to turn my sauce off. And just, just to be clear, an ice water bath is just ice and mm -hmm. water. Ice and water. And it helps keep your vegetables nice and crisp. Um, if I had just kept the fennel over here, it would wilt mm. and get very soggy. Whereas if it's an ice bath, you can also see that it's shocking and it's making it very curly and beautiful, which is also nice when you're plating dishes. I, I I know you like your crunchy fennel, so I do. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! <laughs> All right, so we're using Matisse sardines. Um, you can find these at any grocery store. I personally like them because they're very meaty. Um, they're really really delicious. Maybe before you. Pull those out. You can tip that. We yeah, of course. Get a little look at what yeah. it looks like. Cause it, <laughs> they, they're, they're laid back, tail to head, tail to head. Yes, exactly. So I'm just going to pull one out. And you can see that that's like a that. very nice, nice size. So I'm going to grill these. Okay. So I want to add a little smoky texture to this. He's going to eat one. <laughs> so hey, good. Hey, you got to taste everything, right? right? <laughs> so I have my grill here. So if, if I by chance at my house don't have a grill, mm -hmm. can I have a griddle you on top of my stove top? You can do it on a griddle top? on top of a stove top. I think you can also do it in a pan, like a nonstick pan just to get a nice kind of sear, smoky, high heat. Um, but a griddle pan totally will work just fine. Okay. All right. Man, so I'm way over here and I can start to smell that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm going to get a piece of sourdough. Let's see if I can find one. Is there a special sourdough or whatever my favorite yeah. sourdough is? Your, yeah, whatever your favorite sourdough is. If you don't like sourdough, you can use a different bread. Um, oh, all right. I'm just going to cut this way. And then there's two things you can do for the bread. We're going to grill them as well. You can use the oil from the sardines. I, I, I saw you going there. <laughs> <laughs> Which adds more flavor to your toast. You're not. And, and why not? What are you going to do with the oil? Why not? Anyway, right? You don't want to waste. <laughs> so I'm just brushing both sides. Is, is this an item that occasionally goes on and off your menu as well? or? So we usually will do this as a special. Okay. Um, our menu changes every three months. We actually take the whole menu apart and change everything. Um, it's really important for me to continue the education of what Filipino food tastes like. I think a lot of us grew up with Filipino friends and had like chicken adobo and pancit, but... There's so many more flavors and things to understand about our food. Yeah. You know, there's so much seafood. There's so many um, other ways to experience it. And so for us, it's, and my team, it's really important to keep changing so keep we can keep yeah. 
you know, keep educating people like what the different dishes are, what the names are. Um, and it's fun for us because we get to stay creative. <laughs> I, was about to, I was about to say, you know, really for chefs, we need that ability to like enjoy a flavor. But you know, like once you taste something, you think of something else that would go and, mm -hmm. and you want to evolve, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so yeah, it's really fun. So now with the sardines, I'm thinking, you might want to go to the further right. I'm thinking um, they're fully cooked, so they just need to be warmed yes, through, warm right? Yes, warmed through, exactly. Yeah. And it kind of helps because it helps kind of crisp up the skin because the sardine still has, has its skin. Adds a nice kind of flavor and crunch to the dish. There, there you go with your textural thing. Uh-huh. Like <laughs> I like definitely that. eat with like <laughs> layers and textures and flavors. Uh -huh. Okay. It's very simple, I told you. <laughs> We're almost I'm done. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm thinking this weekend I may be having some sardine toast. Yeah. <laughs> so so from your kitchen that you flipped over to to help you. Know, like a community kitchen, really, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, do, do you have folks come to the kitchen, or do you guys actually deliver? So we actually, um, since the since we reopened the restaurant, uh, we still do community kitchen. Uh, we do community kitchen Mondays and Tuesdays from 12 to 4. Um, anyone can call, uh, and it's no questions asked, and you get a meal. Nice. And then we partnered with... Uh, Wasset and the South Wasset. Park Community Center yes. on Wednesdays. Yep. Um, so we deliver about a hundred meals every Check Wednesday. Yes. <laughs> and then um, on Fridays, we deliver foods to the South Seattle uh, Senior Center in oh. Holly Park every Friday morning. Right on. So right on. we're trying to find a way to do both yeah. um, and make sure that we can still feed people in whatever capacity we can. I mean, there's such a need and that's one of the things that came out of our video how we're partnering, how we all have to partner together to fight this food yes. insecurity that's yeah. happening, right? So many people lost their jobs and just some don't even know where they're getting their next meal. So for yeah. community kitchens like yourself, for what we do, we just got to keep going. I don't yeah. know when it's going to end. We just got to keep feeding the people. <laughs> and I think that's what we realized too is it's like, COVID definitely spotlighted and highlighted this thing that had already been existing. I mean, you guys have been doing the great work for so long. And I think for me, it shifted in my head that it was like, especially when we first became Community Kitchen, it was just like so many people had extra food. There's just like, they had to shut down. And I was like, well, if we can do this, yeah, you know, we're only open Wednesday through Sunday. Like, I can still give work to my team. To produce meals and like they're so passionate about the community kitchen like because yeah. every single one of them is scheduled for a shift and it's so beautiful because now we have regulars and they're, they're starting to form relationships with the people that come and pick up meals and they become kind of like family for that us that becomes yes exactly yes. that's so cool yeah so cool <laughs> all right so all right here we are so simple you're gonna be like oh my god <laughs> I spent more time talking than I did I'm, cooking. I'm ready to taste this bad boy. <laughs> All right, so we have our tomatoes, onion, garlic. I'm just going to smash the tomatoes. I'm going to place it on the toast. Got our sardines. It's 
So it almost looks like one ten could be a shared mm -hmm. appetizer. A shared appetizer. That looks so yummy. I might not be able to hold myself back. And, <laughs> <laughs> and then we're actually going to get our fennel. And some arugula. If you have a bowl, which I wasn't prepared, <laughs> you could get it in the bowl. Um, just season it with a little bit of pepper, a little bit of salt. If you have what? fish sauce at home, this would be a great time to add the fish sauce. Um, but I'm actually just going to use a little bit of lemon. But this is normal. This is... Chefs will figure it out oh, yeah. in, in a closet. <laughs> I think that, like, I think back to all the times we've cooked meals for people, like when I was doing the pop-ups and, like, the certain situations you'd find yourself in trying to cook. Uh, just, But you make it work. So we have this beautiful salad that's just going to finish off this to add some texture, to add some brightness. And then you definitely need a fork and a knife to enjoy the <laughs> sardine toast. And then you have a little bit of... Oh, yeah. And then I have the fennel tops, which we'd said earlier we can use as a garnish. And then I like to add, which we have fried garlic. Fried garlic in Philippine cuisine is so amazing and on everything. Um, I like to add a little bit of fried garlic at the end, just to add a little punch of flavor. A little bit of height there, Chef? It's just going to get more high. And more <laughs> <laughs> but but you, you talked about it early. You got layers in there. You got that smoky bread. Then you got that nice um, wilted garlic, yep. onion, tomato. And then you got your salty, kind of, and probably not too salty, but you got your sardines. And then the crunch came along. Yep. And then all the beauty. This is a wonderful dish. I Thank think you. everybody should be doing this. Thank you. I hope that you guys enjoy making it at home. Um, Chef Wayne, thank you so much for having me today. It was a pleasure to tell you our, like, our story and to share this wonderful dish with you. Chef Melissa, thank you so much for coming down and joining us. It's always a pleasure to have you. And I also want to give another big thanks out to Chef Rachel Yang coming down doing a couple appetizers for us. And I want to give a big heartfelt thanks to you all spending your evening with us. You could have been anywhere. You joined us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to invite you to please join us to our next guest chef night at home on September 9th. We're going to be with Chef Francisco from Modernist Cuisine. He's going to teach us how to cook the perfect pizza. Again, mark your calendars, September 9th. Finally, Fair Start cannot do this work without the support of the entire community. If you can, please donate, volunteer, or help spread the word about our work. You can learn all about that at fairstart.org. I just want to say thank you, thank you, and have a good night. <laughs>